Welcome back to the rating climb. Average Joe is rated 641 and climbing. As usual, I have my list of openings that I'm gonna to try to play here, which I'll talk more about in just a second. But first, I have some very big news. In one week from now, okay, seven days, on July 15th, my brand new course, Breaking 1500, is gonna be opening up for enrollment for five days only. Okay, we're doing that so that I can really focus on the students inside. But if you would like to break the 1500 ELO rating level, this is the way to do it, all right? And just so you're clear on this, most people will never break 1,500. Uh, if you cross 1,500, that, that puts you in the top 97th percentile of chess players on chess.com, okay? It's a massive achievement, and a lot of people start to get stuck around 1,000, and then as you go from 1,000 to 1,500, it gets harder and harder and harder, and unless you kind of know exactly what you need to fix, you're gonna have a hard time getting past 1500. So that's what this course is for. I'm super excited. Trust me, you don't wanna miss it. There's a link in the description if you wanna join the wait list. We'll email you when it's when it's live or you can just mark your calendars July 15th. But that is gonna be super special. So stay on the lookout. All right, let's jump right into a game here, guys. 641, we're playing as black. Okay, so the two gambits that I've been trying to play for a while, Bush Gas Gambit as black. Okay, we might get an opportunity here. If they play Knight F3, we can do it. Come on, come on. If I see queen h5, I might just have to lose it. I might lose my mind if I see queen h5 again. 660 though, maybe they've, you know, graduated past the four move checkmate and they're ready to play some some real openings. Anyway, bush gas gambit is knight f3, bishop to c5, okay? So hopefully we get a chance to see that. I'm not an expert on it, but I did look at a few lines preparing for this this climb. And then the other gambit I really really want to try with black is the Budapest gambit. That's against d4, though. So right now we're we're kind of hoping for knight f3 so we can play the bush gas gambit. Interesting that our opponent is thinking so long. This is very rare that I see someone thinking this much on move one. So I don't really know what that means. Yep, I, I don't really know. Um... Uh, it kind of makes me wonder if the game's going to abort because this is... Oh, nope, nope, nope. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we can't play the Bush Gas Gambit, and it's another variation. It's another variation of the four-move checkmate. So whenever, whenever I see someone attack this pawn, if I'm playing as black, the F7 pawn, I always am on the lookout for things like this, okay? Because that's how the four-move checkmate starts. So... The easiest thing to do, in my opinion, is to play knight f6. Because knight f6 controls h5, so you can't go there. And it also blocks the queen if they do go to f3, which, okay, here we go. There's no checkmate threat, right? My knight's already blocking it. So I don't even have to worry. I can just continue developing, and I'm, I'm pretty happy. So let's play knight c6, just develop a piece. And we're immediately kind of threatening knight to d4, which is a bit of an annoying move for white. Probably have to go back where you came from or maybe somewhere like this. Okay, so they do defend this. So the question is, do I still wanna go there? Probably not, because then this pawn might push forward and that's kind of annoying. So I think what I'm gonna do instead is simply develop a piece. Now, which piece should I develop? Well, the knights are already out. This guy's stuck. I don't really wanna block this one in to let him out. So I'll develop this guy first and we'll go to c5. And why did I choose c5? Well, d6 is bad because it blocks my d-pawn. I need that guy to be able to move forward, okay? b4, I would have probably lost some time after c3, and so c5 just seems like a nice diagonal uh, attacking the weak pawn here. Okay, knight c3, I think we just want to castle, and why do I want to castle? Well, it takes pressure off that weak square because now I have my rook also defending. So we have two pieces, much less likely that we're gonna get into trouble there. Okay, not that I was really worried because I already had the queen blocked off, but it's always nice to have even more support. And it's a move I wanted to play anyways. Okay, d3 is a good move, I think. Uh, they're letting out their bishop, and we do want to be careful because if you get pinned and you don't have a clear response, you can get into trouble. So I'm definitely going to pay attention to this move right here, right? Because there's knight d5, they could attack my knight, and the queen's already attacking my knight. I don't think I really want to allow that. Now, that being said, you also want to be really careful moving pawns in front of your king, right? Because you create weaknesses. So let's think about what other options I have here. I could go on the offensive with something like knight to d4, threatening the queen, threatening a fork. I kind of like the look of that. Now white might take me, but then I could recapture and I'm creating another threat. 
kind of like the look of that. And then maybe we could try to play d5 at some point and open up the king. And so I think that makes the most sense here. You know, normally I would play a move like this to let my pieces out. But in this case, I don't really want to walk into that pin. So I think I do want to do something a little bit more aggressive. So let's go with knight to d4 and kind of put the pressure on our opponent attacking these things here. Okay, really, these are the two major threats. So we'll see how they're going to react to this. And if they move the queen to g3, I believe we could still get away with taking the rook. Now, you have to be a little careful. Like, if the queen's on g3 and the bishop comes to h6, there is going to be checkmate. And I wouldn't be able to take the bishop. However, I'm thinking knight to h5 would be a nice move, which attacks the queen and also defends. So I think we're okay, and so I think this is a legitimate threat. So probably white has to take my knight is what I'm, I'm thinking. And I think we will take back with the pawn, gaining a little time on the knight. Oh, they do go queen g3. Interesting. Okay, so maybe that's the idea. But like I said, uh, I am going to have knight h5. So let me think about that just for a second. Bishop h6, knight h5. Queen moves somewhere. And I think we would be okay. Yeah, I think it's still going to be good enough for us. So let's go ahead. I think we can get away with this. I'm going to go ahead and get the fork. Probably be greedy and take the rook. Ooh, and they go king d2, which... I don't think that's a great move because now they can't even play bishop h6. That was kind of white's one major threat that they had in the position. Now they've blocked that. And so I'm pretty happy to just take the rook. So notice, I didn't wait around for that pin to cause me problems. I went on the offensive and now I have my own threats and I'm able to, to make stuff happen here. Okay, so the queen takes. What's, what's happening? Let's check. The bishop is under attack. So we can move the bishop. We can take that. But instead of taking a pawn, and he, here's why I'm not going to take the pawn. Because then maybe rook f1 happens, and now the rook's involved, and the queen's involved, and the bishop's involved, and maybe the knight's going to jump in. And I don't want to be attacked if I don't have to. So I think what I'm going to do instead is play the move d6. Now, why d6? It attacks the queen, so it gains me a tempo. White has to stop, and they can't develop another piece or create another threat. They have to move their queen. I'm also defending my bishop, and I'm letting this guy out at the same time. So I'm, I'm accomplishing a lot of things all at once, okay? And I value that more than just taking a pawn at this point, especially because I'm already ahead in material, right? I already have a lead in, in material. Now you want to make sure that, you know, my position is solid. I don't get into trouble from that. And so I think d6 is the way to go. So white's queen has to move. I guess probably is going to go back here, maybe here or here. Could be the options. Okay, it goes to g5. So there's a, there's a fork here on the king and the queen. And it's also a discovered attack, but there's a problem with that. Do you guys see what the problem is? The problem is that even though it looks really good because I'm gonna win a queen, white could recapture with the knight and defend the queen, okay? So it doesn't quite work, but almost. So I could play bishop to b4 to actually threaten that, or I could simply just develop another piece, maybe like bishop e6. Both look pretty good. Uh, the only question is how easy is, is it how easy is it for white to deal with that threat? And maybe it's not that easy. I mean, they could probably just move their queen. Would I rather have my bishop here or be developing a piece? Yeah, as much as it's it's probably a tricky threat, I think the smart thing to do is just develop another piece. I just want to develop as quickly as I can. And usually you don't want to get sidetracked by those one move threats unless they're very, very difficult to stop. And I think that one's easy enough to stop. They could just simply move their queen somewhere and that would be the end of it. So I'm not gonna do that. Okay, b3, so they maybe wanna go here and trap my knight, kind of makes sense. Uh, let's see, we could trade the bishops. I am a head material, so I think that makes sense. Now, bishop b4 actually makes more sense to me because they've weakened these light, uh, sorry, these dark squares. And so I think I will go ahead and do that now. And so notice how I had that move kind of in the back of my mind, but I didn't play it until it was even more powerful, okay? And so here we go. Now I'm actually threatening this move that I mentioned earlier. Fork and also winning the queen. So we'll see if white notices that and if they can come up with a way to save their queen here. And by the way, this is something that happens a lot of times when the knight takes the rook in the corner. It usually does get trapped. And a lot of times that's just part of the deal. You're going to lose your, your knight. Yeah, and okay, we are going to lose that. However, what can I play? That's right. 
Knight takes e4, right? This was the tactic that I have been kind of eyeing for these past couple of moves. The reason it didn't work before was because the knight, but we've pinned it. Okay, and so now we can go ahead and proceed. There's a fork. So white has to deal with that by taking me this way. But I've unleashed my queen, and there was nothing defending white's queen. Okay, so there we go. That's how I put that together. And by the way, always be scanning for undefended pieces, right? Especially queens, and if they're in line with something else, that's that's kind of a big clue. All right, so white has to, to deal with the check, and, and we're in good shape. Okay, f4, that's defended by the knight, so I don't want to take that. But this guy is not defended, and that looks like a pretty good target. There's going to be rook g1, but I don't really see too much of a follow-up. Let me go ahead and take that. And this pawn might fall next, or even this one. Notice the pin, right? This knight is pinned, right? Okay, takes my knight. That makes sense. So yeah, I think we have two options here. Could also trade the bishop first. I think I will. Whenever you're ahead, trading is usually a good thing. So let me go ahead, trade the bishop off. And then I'll probably grab the e4 pawn. Now, why am I going to choose the e4 pawn? It's a center pawn. Usually they're a little bit more valuable than the flank pawns. And it also brings my queen closer to the king. So I think I'm going to do this one. And remember, this pin is important. I'm not losing my queen because of the pin, right? And I think if we don't have a follow-up immediately after this, it's time to bring the rooks into the game. So rook to e8, rook to d8, maybe d5, just to kind of open things up. But we'll see what white's going to do, but there might be a, a more immediate move we can play with our queen. Okay, do you notice a more immediate move? The answer is yes, this rook. It's not really defended, because even though the knight's defending it, remember, knight is pinned. And so I will just take the rook for free. You got to watch out for these pins, right? Because if a piece is pinned, yeah, there's the resignation. If a piece is pinned, it's not able to do what it's wanting to do. Okay, let's check the game review here. And I just realized I forgot to put the statistics on. Let me turn those on here. Uh, let me fix this. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm all... Uh... Out of whack here. There we go. We just won this game, so we're at 31 wins. Okay, sorry about that. 97, all right, pretty good. And all right, let's just jump right in to the next game. I don't think there's too much to look at there. New game, okay. All right, so for white, I'm gonna play e4 again, and I wanna try to get another scotch gambit, okay? Because I didn't really get to talk about some of the stuff that I wanted to last time, so let me see if we can play another scotch gambit. I know we did get to play it one time. All right, good. So the first step is to play the scotch game, okay? And then when they take us, or if they take us, we're not going to capture back, we're gonna play bishop to c4. Very good, perfect, all right. So bishop to c4, now black has two options here. Bishop c5, and knight to f6, okay? Um, bishop c5 is, um, I believe it's called the Haxo Gambit. Oh, bishop, yeah, this is another move. This one is not as common. I don't think it's as good for black. I think bishop c5 and knight f6 are played more often. But usually what I like to do when I'm playing an aggressive gambit against the move bishop to b4 check is I like to push this pawn forward. And there's a couple of reasons for that. But number one, is that if I want to, I can recapture and gain a tempo. And when you're playing these gambit openings, usually tempos or the quick development, getting the pieces out as fast as possible, usually that's very valuable. So I definitely think this is a move that I should probably consider. Now that being said, developing a piece to a nice square is also a good plan as well. So both of these moves could be played, but we'll just go with this one to gain the tempo. Oh, wow. And a pre-move there or something. Uh, maybe they were expecting the knight. And that's why you don't pre-move um, if you're not sure what your opponent's going to do. So we'll take that. And unfortunately for our opponent, they just lost that piece there. Okay. What I was going to say is if they retreated somewhere, they had to be really careful for tactics along this diagonal. Because we had queen d5, bishop takes f7. Okay, knight to b4. So there's something that jumps out at me as soon as I see this move. And it's the fact that the knight is undefended. Okay, whenever you have pieces that are undefended like this, that's a clue. That's a clue that there could be a tactic available. So what do you guys think 
is going through my mind right now? Well, I'm thinking about bishop takes f7 check, luring the king there so that I can play queen b3 and then take the knight. That's definitely one option. I'm also thinking about playing queen b3 first and threatening the knight and threatening to take here. That's another option. Um, and I'm also thinking about I could just ignore it and castle. That looks totally fine as well. Just get away from this threat altogether. But if I'm able to win the knight, I probably should just do it, right? Now, queen b3, there is queen e7, which defends both of those things. So I think I'm going to go ahead and take it first. Okay, so here we go. Very, very common tactic when you play these, these openings uh, with the bishop on c4. Always be looking for that because you, if you compare that with a queen move like this, it's usually a pretty good follow-up. Okay, so here's the fork. Of course, black could block, but that doesn't really help them. We still just take it for free. And so we're getting our piece back and the pawn. And on top of that, we've exposed black's king. So very, very good deal for us. Okay. I'm going to take this next. Oh, they go knight to d5. So now the question is, which way do we take it? And I like the queen because it's with check. But I also like the knight. Because even though it's not with check right now. Oh, wow. All right. <laughs> even though it's not with check right now, it sets up a discover check which is gonna be very, very annoying for black. And I guess they got frustrated there that I was moving too slowly. So, okay. Well, the take your time and force your opponent to resign strategy strikes again. Okay, 95, not too bad. We're at 32 wins. And yeah, we didn't, unfortunately, didn't get to talk too much about the Scotch Gambit. So I might try to play that one more time. I'm hoping that we can actually see some of the opening lines and traps and, and talk about some of this stuff, but it's going to come later. It's, it's going to come later in the rating climb. Let's keep going. All right, we're playing as black here. E4, all right, we're going to go for the bush gas gambit again. So we're, we're looking for knight f3, which <laughs> there we go. All right, so bush gas gambit, bishop to c5. You'll notice we're ignoring the pawn on e5. Okay, that's why it's a gambit. And wow. I'm so sorry, guys. This is just h4. What are you going to do? All right, h4. Well, um, <laughs> knight takes e5 is the move that a lot of people play because it's a, it's a free pawn, right? And then you could play knight c6, and it's sort of like a Stafford gambit where if they take you, they win a pawn, but now both of your bishops come out and you're able to attack quickly, and I was hoping that we were going to see that, but obviously we're not. So... I think I'm just going to bring out my knight and defend the pawn. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is why you don't want to spend all your time studying openings, right? This is why you need a course like Breaking 1500 where you focus on the middle game and like how to think because, yeah, anyway. Let's go ahead uh, and develop. Notice I'm keeping an eye on this and I'm thinking our opponent might, yeah, there you go. They might try to play knight g5. So I was actually planning ahead for that when I played the move knight f6. What was my plan? Well, my plan was I'm going to castle, and that's how I'm going to add a defender to that pawn. Now, I could also consider a move like d5, but then we uh, might go into some sort of like fried liver type deal, and I don't really want to do that. So I'm just going to go ahead and castle. Now, some of you might say, but Nelson, what about the pawn on h4? Aren't you concerned by this? And the answer is yes and no. Um, yes, you have to be careful, but at the same time, if my opponent's going to keep spending moves doing that, they're neglecting their king, they're neglecting development, they're neglecting their control over the center, and I'm going to strike with d5, open things up, and, and just, I'm not going to wait around for that to happen, essentially. And I could also play h6 if I wanted to to stop that. But they're going to go for this trade. This is not a good trade for white, okay? This is a good trade for me. Usually the knight and the bishop is better than the rook and the pawn. So I am very happy by this, okay? Remember, rooks are endgame pieces. That rook is not going to be valuable for white probably for a while. My knight and bishop are going to be very valuable during the middle game. And so it's just a great, it's just a great situation for me. So step number one, let's just scan. Do I have any tactics? I don't think so. I think we need more pieces. So D6 or D5, right? We want to strike at the center. We want to get the, the pieces out. I think I'm going to go with d5 because let's actually there's there is this check check we could go back let's just make sure the, here's the thing the knight on f6 does a fantastic job of stopping white's queen okay doesn't you can't go there you can't go there um if I play d5 takes and takes I do have to watch out for the queen move now queen f3 is not a big deal I could just go back 
But queen h5 is a bit more annoying because I don't really want to allow the queen to come in and just destroy my king side. Looks like I could go back and be okay. But that's what I'm thinking through, okay? And so because of that, maybe d6 would be a better move, but I think it's okay. So I'm going to play d5. But the point, the point is you have to make sure you, you calculate this before you just play that move, okay? So um, knight takes... Check, king goes here. Actually, da, da, da. yeah, it's fine. It's fine. There is this line too. Takes, takes, check. King goes back. Queen e8. It almost looks like checkmate, but it's not. I do have bishop f8. So I think I'm fine. But you again you have to make sure you're calculating this stuff because you can get into trouble if you're not. Okay, he goes for queen f3, which looks like a fork. But like I said, I have this nice move knight to f6 where I save my knight and I block the check at the same time. And I'm pretty happy. So now we have moves like bishop g4 that come to mind, knight to d4 come to mind, and you're really gonna see, you're really gonna see how this knight and bishop can outperform the rook and the pawn, okay? All right, so let's identify what, what's the threat. Well, the threat is maybe to take here. That seems very well defended, though, so that would just be a trade. The other threat is to take here, and that's undefended, so that's a bigger deal, right? And there's also a move knight to g5 check that I might want to pay attention to, although I think I could just move back and probably be okay. However, that being said, let's just, let's just say hypothetically that I move my bishop back and white goes knight g5 check and I move my king here. Do you notice any moves that I should be concerned about? The answer is queen b3 check. Okay, and the reason that's such a concerning move is because if, if I try to tuck my king in the corner, I'm going to get forked. And if I move my king here, I'm going to get checkmated. Now, it looks to me like I would have queen d5 and I would be okay, but that's what you have to watch out for. Okay, that's what you have to watch out for. So that's why I'm thinking about actually knight to d4 instead. Because knight to d4, check, king goes here. You can't go to b3 because my knight. I kind of like the look of that, actually, just going on the offensive. Yeah, I think we do want to do that. So let me think. Knight to d4, is there any way that I'm going to get into trouble and lose a bishop? Can the queen go somewhere? No, no, I don't think so. If you take this, I don't really care. If you check me first, I just go back. I'm still pretty happy with that position. Yeah, I think it's a safe move. So let's jump in. And notice that B3 square, right? I'm controlling it so I don't have to worry about these checks here, okay? Tricky position though, it is a very tricky position. Okay, queen to d3, yeah, that just doesn't seem like the right move. Um, th there's a couple of reasons why that doesn't seem like the right move to me. Number one, it blocks the pawn, so the bishop is stuck. That's usually not a good sign. Number two, it's lined up with the square that my bishop could land on. So I'm thinking about bishop f5. Bishop's defended. You could throw in a check, but I would just move. Uh, then there's queen c4. Maybe that's an idea. Okay. So there, check. I would have to go to like the dark square. And then I'm I'm okay because I could throw in this and defend with like queen e7. Yeah, this is a very complicated position. So don't feel bad if you're not following everything. But I think what I'm going to do is play bishop f5 here. It looks like it's a safe choice to me. Let me just verify this one more time. Yeah, that's covered. That's covered. That should be fine. Okay, so we're going to go bishop f5, putting the pressure here on the knight and on the, the queen. Oh, and you know what? Maybe I could have actually just taken first. Maybe that was the simplest way. Yeah, maybe that would have been an easier way to do it. The way that I'm doing it, it's kind of complicated, um, but I think I probably had an easier solution there. Oh, actually, wait a second. So uh, 96... There's knight g5, which I just now am realizing. King e7 takes, takes. I actually lose a bishop there. Oh, wow. Okay, that's not ideal. Yeah, that's not ideal. So, hmm. I guess we can go queen d5, though. Yeah, honestly, this is a surprising move here. I wasn't expecting that. Let's, let's see, queen d5. Takes, takes, takes. We still get the rook. Looks okay. Very tricky. And this is why you have to be careful with pieces that are undefended, right? So yeah, white's actually doing pretty well here. Let me go queen d5. And they could trade and win my bishop, but the problem for them is that I'm going to get the rook. 
And if my knight can escape, that's a good trade for me. Now, if my knight gets trapped, then it's not that good. But I think my knight could get out. Yeah, they're going to do, do this. You're going to take the bishop. And then we're going to go for the fork. Very tricky position, though. Um, and may, maybe I had some an easier way to do that. We might look at this one after the game just to see what the easiest way was. Because I feel like I didn't play that quite accurately. Yeah, knight to g5 check. Okay. So I'm going to move my king, and I think I'm going to go up. Although I could go to e7 to avoid the checks from the knight. I just want to keep my king kind of towards the center. Yeah, let me actually go king e7. I don't have to worry about any potential checks from the knight. So we still have our threat here that white has to deal with, and it's not really easy to deal with that. Okay, they decide to castle. So let's see, what am I going to do? Of course I could take the pawn. That looks pretty good. I could also go for a check. I don't know what the follow-up would be. Or I could chase this knight away. And the idea is then I could take here, really just open up the king side. That also looks pretty good. Is that better than taking here? No, I think what I'm going to do is take here first because it attacks the rook. After the rook moves, I think I will just go back. Okay. And I'm going to make the rook move again. And then I'll probably play h6. So essentially I got my pawn for free. Now I can continue with h6, which is annoying for the knight. And we'll go from there. Let's see, there might be another move too. Knight f4, trying to jump in. Bishop d3 looks like it could be good. Bishop d3. Ah, I wonder if there's a, let's see, bishop d3, bishop e2. I think I see a way to trap the rook actually. I think I see a way to trap the rook. So I will go back. I didn't see this before. That's why I'm going back. Otherwise, I would have played this sooner. After the rook moves, I'm going to go here. And the rook has to go to d1, and then it runs out of squares. You guys see that? So that looks pretty nice. So yeah, we're going to go ahead, bishop to d3. And the rook is actually trapped. All right, so bishop, bishop to e2. And you can see how, like, the knight and the bishop's pretty powerful. We're just kind of forcing these rooks all over the place because they're high-value pieces. You have to try to save them, but the knight and the bishops can just keep facing them around. So, yeah, now we can trap it. Let's just make sure there's no forks or anything happening with the knight. I mean, yeah, I'm going to lose a pawn, but that's fine. I'll get a rook. It's a good trade. And, yeah, white's in trouble. White's in trouble. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that this bishop never got developed, right? Because if this bishop was developed, you could have easily moved your rook to the... C, uh, C1 square, and this wouldn't have happened, right? But because that bishop's there, they don't have a lot of options. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and take the bishop for the rook trade there. And now I think I will play h6 just to save this pawn. Let's go ahead and do that. And it's, since I have two minutes, I'm going to move a little bit faster. Okay, my bishop's under attack, so let's just... Save the bishop. Maybe we go back. Uh, it seems pretty good. I don't think we need to overthink that one. Probably going to use my rook here on the f file. I like the look of that. Targeting the f2 pawn. Okay. Bishop can come out here. Put me in check. Well, no, I'll just take it. So that's not really a big deal. Let's go ahead. Bring the rook there. Create this attack on f2. Now, of course, it's defended. But we might have some ideas to move that knight in just a second. For example, rook f4 looks pretty good. F4, okay, he's attacking my knight. So I guess we just move the knight. Probably, let's see here, so we can jump into d3. Yeah, that looks really good, right? Just jumping around to those weak squares and continuing to build the pressure on, on these uh, pieces. And now we can take this. We can also take the bishop, although I assume white's going to defend that, maybe with something like rook c2. Yep, so we could trade... Or just take here. Yeah, and I think I'd rather just take this. So there we go. We've got the knight. We've got the bishop. We've got the rook. Only defended two times, so we're okay. And we're creating the discovered check. Very, very powerful because now we can move our knight wherever we want and unleash the rook. Okay? Okay. 
All right, king to e2 doesn't really deal with the threat on the knight, so we'll just take the knight. We could probably invade here with the rook. That looks pretty good. Remember when you get the rook on the on the second rank, that's usually a good sign. Yeah, and I'm actually seeing. Do we have a checkmate here? Uh, let's see. We have check. Oh, the bishop could take that. It almost looks like there really should be checkmate. Check. Wow. Uh, hmm. Check. I can't believe that I don't see a checkmate. It really looks like there should be checkmate. Oh, yeah. Is this a checkmate? Checkmate. There you go. There you go. Basically, I knew that like the king was running out of squares, so I was just trying to figure out, okay, where do I put my pieces to deliver the checkmate? So the rook's covering here, the knight's covering here. Here, all we have to do is check the king, and it's checkmate, so we can go bishop e3. Okay, cool. So let's let's actually check this game. This was an interesting one. So let me go game review. It's, we're up to 33 wins, but I think that person played pretty well, honestly, for, for 650, okay? So here's the accuracy. Yeah, so we, I think we did make a one or two mistakes there. Let's see what they were. So, Bushgas Gambit, H4, okay. Okay, castling, good. Notice, I'll show you the eval bar there, three, okay? Black, black has a significant advantage after this trade, right? So Stockfish agrees with me there that the knight and the bishop are better than the rook and the pawn, okay? Sorry, let me readjust my, my board here. Okay, so we took that. Great. D5 was the good best move. Great. Um, no, so every, everything that I did was actually fine, although it was it was very tricky here. Okay, and I, I actually missed some of the ideas after this. But notice I was developing pieces and I was creating threats. If you were developing pieces and creating threats, you're almost always going to have good options that, available to you. Almost every time, even if you, like in this case, miss a move, right? I missed this queen c4 move because I was developing my pieces to good squares. Stockfish is like, yeah, you're just, you're totally fine. You're totally fine. Uh, even here, like we talked about, if white would have taken this, I have a fork now. I'm just great, right? So keep developing the pieces, keep making those threats and you're gonna be, gonna be just fine. So we saw the bush gas gambit, but not really because h4 is not, you know, um, We'll try again. Let's try again. All right. Okay. Maybe maybe now. Let's go e5. And let's see if we see a knight f3 here. There we go. All right. So again, let's try it one more time. Bush gas gambit. And we'll see if white's going to take the pawn this time. No. They go bishop c4. Now, bishop c4 is not a bad move. Um, let's see. We could just transpose to something else. I, what I'm thinking about is what if we just play knight f6? Just try to like put the pressure on the pawn. If they take us, we could probably castle. I don't, then there's a d4. Yeah, I don't really know how good that is. So maybe, here's the thing. A lot of times I would allow this if I have a good follow-up. But if it's going to just put me on the defensive again with like another threat, then I feel like maybe it's not the right time. And so I probably should just defend this. So I'm going to play knight c6. And notice um, we've basically transposed to a Juvico piano. Normally it would be e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5. I've tried to play this gambit first, but nobody really is accepting it. So if they don't accept it, we just kind of have to transpose back to these other lines. And they can't, they can't do this because the queen is there guarding that. That's kind of an important detail. Yeah, c3 is a good move, I think. So... Usually when you when you see c3, you want to attack the e4 pawn because there's not going to be a knight that can defend it. And so I think that's what I'm going to do with knight to f6, just putting the pressure on the e4 pawn. And it looks like white's going to try to get a nice center here with d4, which makes sense. But we now have our own pressure on e4, like I said. And so also castling, getting the rook over, all this stuff is what we're trying to do here. Okay, now queen to c2 is an interesting move. I don't think it's that great of a move. And the reason is 
they don't they no longer are threatening d4 because now takes 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 right I'm, i just have enough pieces there and i think that was one of white's major threats so i don't think that was a great decision but maybe it's okay. I mean, I guess it's fine if they're just going to play d3 and, and be happy with that position. So I'm going to go ahead and castle. I think just get the king out of the center, add some support to f7. Can't go wrong with a move like that, right? And I'm looking at d6, and I'm also looking at d5, okay? d6 is nice and, and solid like this, lets out the bishop. d5 is a little bit more aggressive if I want to open things up. Since I'm castled and... White is not. Maybe opening things up does make sense because you always have the rook coming over and they have to spend move the castle. So let's see d5. Takes, I bring take with the knight. I think that makes a lot of sense. So let's let's go ahead and strike with d5. Notice normally there's a knight on c3 that would kind of prevent some of this stuff. But if they're going to play c3 and not put the knight there, I'm going to try to take advantage of that and play d5. Ooh, the castle. Okay, the idea is good. The idea is good, but remember, I, I think I said this in a recent video, um, the right move at the wrong time can be the wrong move, right? And that's what we see here. It's the right move. It's the right idea, but you can't do it when your bishop's under attack. You just can't do that, right? So we're just going to take the bishop. Always have to, the, the order of your thinking should be, what did my opponent just play? Are they threatening anything? Okay, no, they're not. Once that you say, no, they're not, then you go to like, all right, what am I going to do? Let me castle because that's a good move, right? But you always have to start with, what did my opponent's last move do? If you don't start there, you're going to miss th this, right? You're just going to miss this. That's a big deal. So. Not only do, do they lose their, their bishop, but now my pawn is like putting pressure. Yeah, and they have to get this messed up pawn structure. This is a target now. And so it's just not a good situation for, for white to be in. All right, so what do we need to do? Do I have any obvious moves? I don't think so. Do I need to develop? I could go to e3 and attack here, or I could go to g4 and attack here. Both look very good. Is one better than the other? I don't know. There's also b4, so if I wanted to, I could stop that because like, for example, if I go back here, my bishop gets trapped by the pawns. So I would have to go back here, which is kind of passive. So it might make sense to play a5. It's a, it's a toss up because I really want to get the bishop developed, but I also don't want to allow that if possible. So should I pause and do this? Mm, yeah, I think the answer is yes. I think it makes sense in this case. So we will pause. You know, you always want to follow the principles, but if there's a specific reason to break it, like here, then then I think it's okay. And that's what we saw. Bishop e3. Okay, I'm going to go queen e7 because I want to get the queen off that square anyway, so I can put a rook on the open file. So if I can do that and deal with the threat at the same time, that's what I'm going to do. Now, I also could have just taken it and and given the double isolated pawns. The issue with that, and maybe issue isn't the right word, but one thing about that is it does open up this for the rook. I didn't really want to do that, and so I feel like queen e7 is just a nice, very solid move. So bishop here, bishop here next, and then bring the rooks to the d file seems to be my my game plan here. Okay, a3. So here's an interesting moment, and I want to show you guys something. This is very, very good to understand. When somebody is trying to push forward, when you've played a5, it can ha happen on h5 as well. But when you've played this to stop them, there's a couple things you have to understand. Number one, even if they go there, there's going to be a pin with the rook. So they can't, act, they're not actually threatening to play b4, because I would simply take, and if they take, I just take. If they take my bishop, they lose a the rook. Okay, you see that? That's an important feature. Now, let's say that the knight was here and the rook was defended and that's there's not a pin. The other thing you can do is play a4. And what a4 does is gives you the option to en passant, okay? That's a very useful, a very good way to use en passant, right? Is to stop this pawn from pushing past you, okay? So that's definitely a move that I could play now because I have the pin. I'm not going to worry about it, but just keep that in mind, okay? So let's see. I think... I think, do I want to go here and attack this, or do I want to go here? It's pretty easy to deal with. I think the knight would just move. I don't know how good that is. Here, there could be b3. You know what? I actually will play a4. I actually will play a4 for the reason that I just mentioned. We have on passant here to stop b4. But also, against b3, I could take. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to go here and attack this pawn. 
And I don't want white to be able to defend it. And it, because if they had to play B3 or B4, then their pawn structure is just totally messed up. Isolated, double isolated, they're super weak, right? Okay, they are going to go B4. And so here you go. This is exactly what I was talking about. We can on passant it. And look at this. Look at the pawn structure. Weak, weak, weak. So the question now is just how do I best take advantage of that? And uh, you know what I'm noticing? This E4 pawn is now undefended, actually. So maybe I just start with that one. This guy's defended, so we can just leave the bishop there temporarily. Yeah, let's go ahead. Take the pawn on E4. And continue thinking about how to target these weak, weak squares. Very, very powerful idea, though, of, of pushing that pawn forward like that. Just, it basically stops two pawns, right? Go back to this position. It basically stops two pawns from moving forward. Unless you're willing to do what this person did and, and allow the weak pawn structure, right? We actually talk, uh, this is a good time for me to mention, in Breaking 1500, we actually talk about pawns a lot and how to use them and little tricks like that and, and things that you want to think about. So definitely um, check that out if you haven't. I mean, it's not live yet, but it's it's coming, like I said, July 15th. Okay. So obviously the knight's under attack. Trading is fine since I'm ahead material, so there's nothing wrong with trading. But I'm going to just scan. Do I have any other better moves like coming back here? No, that's blundering a piece. I could defend, but then I have to, you know, do I really want to give this up? It's probably not the end of the world, but then I do have to move my knight. So maybe I don't want to do that. So, yeah, I think maybe now is a good time to just trade some pieces. Since I am ahead, I think I will. I think I will just go ahead and trade some stuff off. Also could have taken this pawn. I just realized that. Probably could have taken the pawn. Actually, that was going to get tricky. No, tactically, maybe it didn't work. Okay, I think I want to just trade here. And like I said, I'm up a piece. Remember earlier the blunder? So because I'm ahead, trading and simplifying down towards the end game usually is going to make your life easier. And so that's what, I, what I'm doing here. Queen c5 looks like a nice square for my queen. Attacks here, puts pressure here. Yeah, let's do it. Queen c5. Notice how, guys, this is important. Notice how I'm I'm creating a threat. But I'm also playing a move that just kind of makes sense anyway. Because what a lot of people do is they play moves that make threats, but they don't make sense. For example, I could have played the move queen d8, which, okay, it creates a threat. But do I really want my queen to go back to d8? Well, no, I, that's not really a good square for my queen to be on right now. So what I did instead was I created a threat, but also advanced my queen to a more powerful square where I'm... Defending this, I'm attacking this, I'm attacking this, I'm attacking this, I'm controlling some more squares over here. It's a more active square. So that's that's important. You want to look for those threats that also move a piece to where you want to move it to anyway. Does that make sense? Because I see a lot of beginners, they're like, oh, I'm going to go here and attack the knight. Well, yeah, but then they just move their rook, and now your queen's on a bad square. You have to watch out for a discovered attack, and you're going to waste time moving your queen again. You know what I mean? Same thing with this bishop. I'm going to try to move it to a square that maybe has a threat, but also it's like a nice square that I would want it to be on. Wow, king to f2. Okay, so it does defend the pawn. I'll give him that. But, you know, very, very risky move. So when I see that, my focus immediately changes, right? My focus immediately changes from let me hunt some weak pawns to let me hunt the king because now the king is out, right? That's a big deal. So how do I do that? Well, I really would love to put my knight here. Because then I could jump here or jump here. So I'm, I'm I'm tempted to just sacrifice this pawn. Let's see what happens if the knight takes. Ah, there's queen check. Look at that. It's a fork. King's going to have to move somewhere and I take the knight. So I actually can do that. So this is something, you know, you look for moves that you would like to be able to play. And then if you can't, you try to find a tactical reason or idea for why you actually can. And that's what I'm doing here. Another reason would be like, even if I lose the pawn, I don't care because it opens up the file. I'm, I'm happy, right? Okay, a4, not quite sure. So I think now I want to just jump in. I think I want to just jump in with my knight. And very simple, very simple plan. I'm coming here or I'm coming here and I'm, I'm attacking the king and my queen's probably going to come in. This one looks more powerful actually because then the defense here and my queen can, can come in. So notice, identify the weakness in the position. 
play a move that allows me to take advantage of that. that that's all I'm doing. Okay, so he stops one threat. But what about this one? That's also a very nice score for my knight, and I think probably want to jump in there. I'm also attacking this pawn, so like I could just play bishop e6 and try to take this first. Let's say I go here. If he goes back this way, I'm happy to take the pawn. So I think the move would have to be king e2 to defend. And then do we have a follow-up in that position? Hmm. I don't see an immediate follow-up. Yeah, I don't see an immediate follow-up, so I could go with bishop e6 just to take this and come in that way. Yeah, it's so in a position like this, you don't want to lose you lose all your time thinking about it, so I'm just going to play a move that I think is, is good, bishop e6. Just getting the, the rooks connected. Now I have maximum options on, you know, where do I want to move them to, right? Um, creates an attack on this. Just kind of saving that move for later when it might be more powerful, basically. And white can take this pawn whenever they, they want. Um, but like I said, it kind of opens up the file. I use that to attack. I think that would be totally fine. So rook to da looks like a really good move, actually. Just getting another piece involved that way. Queen b5. Interesting. So, of course, there's a threat on my queen. Uh... Hmm. I mean, trading is not bad because I'm ahead the material. It does allow white to fix their pawn structure a little bit. But I'm still pretty happy with the position. I'm just kind of scanning if there's anything else. There's like this tricky little move here to defend my queen that way. So I could just actually let him take it and do that, um, which maybe I will actually do that. It actually looks nice because here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a rook involved. Okay, and after this, I'm going to go with the fork, check, he moves, I take the queen. Now my knight defends that pawn, my rook's involved, there's the pressure here, my knight's ready to jump in wherever it wants, it's putting pressure here, it's a really nice position. So, you don't, you don't always have to get fancy, but sometimes getting fancy can, can be nice. Yeah, and that's what we're going to do. Jump in, and we take the queen. Okay, and so here we go. We've got the knight that we can simply take. Now, I also could take here with check. I don't know if that's better. It might be, but then this also looks really good. So we'll just take this because we're threatening a fork here. We're threatening a skewer here. We're threatening to invade with the rook here. We're threatening a fork here. Lots of big threats. All right, so... And with a minute and 36 on the clock, I do want to speed up a little bit because we're still in an end game where the game is not over at this moment. Let me just go ahead and take here with check. I'll just mop up some pawns. Usually you are going to need to get a queen to actually win the game. And so I want to make sure I leave myself enough time to do that. Push a pawn down the board, get a queen, that kind of thing, right? Sometimes you can find checkmate, but not all the time. So let me just go here, attack the pawn, take the pawn. And now we're set up. We can start pushing here. Of course, I'm going to scan for tactics and forks and pins and all that good stuff. But probably the simplest and easiest thing is to just push the pawn. Let's go b5. Let me go with the check. I, I say that I'm actually noticing that maybe we could go for a checkmate here with the rooks. Go check because we have the knight helping. 
go check. Okay. Uh, here's a check. Here's a check. So there, yeah, there could be, let's see. Hmm. If I go check, he goes here. We could do this. I'm going to lose my rook, but it just simplifies everything. Oh, he goes that way instead. Okay, that's is not as good. Yeah, we'll still take this with check. Uh, let's see. All right, I don't see it checkmate, so I'll just go ahead and take the rook. I thought maybe there was a checkmate, but it's somehow he's seems to be escaping, but the only thing we have to watch out for is like some sort of back rank checkmate. But the rook has no way. Yeah, the rook has no way to do it. The other thing would be a stalemate. It's not a stalemate. Okay, you have to make sure. Have to make sure it's not a stalemate. But I saw a place that the king could move to. So we're fine. Okay, and they do resign. All right. So good game to our opponent. I think they played pretty well, uh, actually. So props to them. Um, let's check this. Okay, 89, 79, not too bad. And let's jump into the next game. I think we have time for one more game here. Okay. <clears throat> uh, should I try the Scotch Gambit again? Let me see my, my openings here. We're definitely going to play E4. You know what? Somebody wanted the Vienna Gambit. Let's try the Vienna Gambit. We haven't played that at all, I don't think. We'll, we'll go with the Vienna Gambit. So the Vienna Gambit is yeah this is actually the main the main line here you play f4 and it's like a king's gambit but you put the knight on c3 first and then you throw your f pawn forward and yeah this is actually i believe a mistake i don't think black is supposed to take you because it allows you to push your pawn forward and when you push your pawn forward what you'll notice is the knight has nowhere to go you can't go there because of my knight and you can't go here because of my queen so if you're going to move the knight somewhere, you have to go back where you came from. And that's not, yeah, that's not a good start to the opening, right? So that is why I believe this is not the way to do it. Now, queen e7 maybe could get a little tricky, but I could also just probably play queen e2, and I think you still have to move the knight back, so it doesn't really accomplish anything. And now I'm pretty happy. Now, when you play the f pawn forward, this is really critical. You always have to watch out for queen h4 check stuff. And the simplest and easiest way to stop that is with knight to f3. Because the knight controls that square, they can't go there. So I'm going to do this before I do anything else to make sure there's no shenanigans with the queen. Now I'm going to play d4, just get nice strong center, and let my bishop out so I can get rid of this pawn. Okay? And the opening has been a success for us, right? Because we forced this knight to go back. And you can see how far behind black's development is. That's why I have to be really careful taking that pawn in the Vienna Gambit. Okay. Is it a serious pin? Not really. I could just recapture it. There's not a knight that's ready to come in and attack me anymore. So I think I could safely take this pawn back. That being said, I could also try to shove this pawn forward. Yeah, that could even be better. But we'll just, for the simplicity's sake, we'll just take the pawn and develop a piece. That seems like a very good move. D5 definitely is a move that's on my radar as well. Just gaining even more space. And yeah, maybe, honestly, maybe what I should have done was play d5 first and then take the pawn. I bet that was the more accurate way to do it. Okay. So what is going through my mind here? Um, basically, what I like to do in positions like this is just sort of very quickly scan. One, two, three, four. I don't know why I just tapped my head. Anyway, very quickly scan for moves. For example, d5, takes, e6, e3, bishop c4, bishop b5 super quickly just to try to come up with an idea of like what might make the most sense so like d5 is an obvious one because it attacks the knight but if they take me and i take them and they take me and i take them they could pin me but i could pin them that seems pretty good uh what about the bishop i like getting the bishop out because then we have ideas of stuff here i also like going to b5 because then the knight is been and maybe we play d5 that even looks maybe even better i really like this because then i can castle and put my rook on the f file okay so all these different ideas are in my mind. And yeah, I think I like bishop b5 the best. But notice, I was scanning 
and finding all the different options before I decided on this one. Okay, well now the knight is, is out of the game, so this is probably just knight e5. Now, here's the thing. If I play knight takes e5, there's one thing that immediately should come to my mind that I have to be careful about. What is it? Queen to h4 check, right? Remember, the knight on f3 stops the queen. As soon as I move it, what's going to happen? Now, my bishop's under attack. I'm getting forked. Should I panic? No, I have bishop g3. Attacks the queen. It's defended. This is defended. Everything looks good. But you, you have to consider that, right? You have to make sure you think through that. So I think I want to take here. Let's see if there's any other moves. I don't really want to trade queens because I'm trying to, like, attack the king since I have a lead in development. I think I'd rather take with the knight. And now we have pressure here. Still threatening to castle, which is going to be great. Gets my king out of danger. Lines up the rook. You can even use the e-file then. And I think black is going to be in trouble. But we did have to calculate this queen h4 move. Like I mentioned, we have g3. By the way, if you're thinking the queen could take d4, that doesn't work. Because I would just take it because the knight is pinned, remember. Right? The knight cannot move. Okay, he takes here. I'm just going to take back. There is queen to d5. Maybe that's what he's trying to do. No, queen to d5, I think I was going to play queen e2 because it defends, it defends, it lines up here. But uh, yeah, that would have been an interesting move. Okay, so bishop d7. Again, I'm going to just scan really, very quickly, like boom, 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 different moves. For example, if I just trade, okay, that seems fine. What if I go on the offensive and attack here? And maybe there's g6, okay. What if I just castle? What happens after this? Yeah, that's that's actually okay. What about ooh, what about queen e2? What about queen e2? Because queen e2, if you take me, I take check. Yeah, maybe it's not that powerful. But if I take here and then you're in a double pin, ooh, that looks pretty good actually. That looks pretty good. Then we have the bishop pair on an open board. Ah, I'm starting to like the look of that. So notice what I did. I was just kind of going one, going two, going through all these different moves till I came up with one that I think makes the most sense. Yeah, I think I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm going to take, go for the bishop pair here. And I'm going to have this knight double pinned. Both bishops are in a very active positions. And then I'm probably just going to castle. And the bishop pair on an open board like this is very, very valuable. We can check after the game, see what Stockfish recommended here. But I suspect maybe... It's going to agree with me here. Okay, I could go check, but then they just block. It doesn't really accomplish a whole lot, I think. Ah, what about d5, actually? d5. Threatening the knight, which is pinned. If you try to go check, I just sidestep somewhere. Maybe I would even go to d2. Threatening a pin here. I'm still threatening the knight. Oh, there's castling, though. So I would have to move maybe to f1 instead. Okay, castling. Oh, but then my queen. Ooh, that's actually an interesting move. Queen e7. Yeah, so queen e2 takes, takes a6. A very tricky position. Bishop back b5. So just because I'm not sure, I'm just going to go with a nice solid move of castling. A lot of times this is a way to win a piece. But this position seems a bit more tricky because there's some interesting stuff that happens after queen e7 and sometimes black can play a6 to try to just trade with you. So when in doubt, just play the solid move. In this case, it's just going to be castling. Okay, bishop's under attack. I think I'm just going to retreat. I don't really want to give up my bishop pair. And every pawn that moves forward creates some weaknesses that maybe I can take advantage of. So I'm just going to drop back. They want to play b5. That's fine. Okay, I'll just drop back. And notice this diagonal now has been weakened. And castling queenside for, for black is probably not going to happen because of these weaknesses. So I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. Very, very nice moment for us. What can we do? Well, I believe the answer is rook to e1 check. Now, why is rook to e1 check such a powerful move? It might not be the only good move. I think bishop g5 might be, be good too, but I'm just going to go with rook e1 check. Why is it such a powerful move? Because you can't castle if you're in check. 
and black is really trying to castle because if they can castle then their position is not terrible they've castled they it's even material relatively i still have the bishop pair but but by not being able to castle they're in trouble they're in big trouble now you say they can play 97 but i have a trick against that there we go what's my trick my trick is queen e2 and what queen e2 does is still stops them from castling because if they castle they lose the king as a defender if you lose the king as a defender you're going to lose a piece right knight to d5 is not a good move can you guys see why well it's a very simple tactic but uh, we have a checkmate thread here okay it's defended two times the knight and the queen but if i take this now it's only defended one time and if the queen recaptures me it's not defended at all and we simply have checkmate right so basically it's a free knight this knight can't move because it's pinned so it's a free knight now we have more threats they finally castle but it's too late right and everything's falling apart i'll just take the rook probably take the knight next move yep and you can just see how getting the rook and the queen lined up before the king was able to castle is why i had such a strong position and really it all went back to the second or third move of the game when uh back here when they decided to take and allowed me to push and they had to go back with their knight right they were behind because of that you could see how as early as move four ended up affecting basically the outcome of the game uh even later okay what should i play there's only one move that i should play in this position only one move all right well hopefully you notice the back rank there is a checkmate it's a queen sacrifice and that's going to do it, okay? All right, so good game to our opponent. Um, I do want to analyze just that one part of this game because I think we can learn something from that. Yeah, 90. I think we had maybe a few better moves. Let's take a quick look here. Okay, it takes. Yes, so d5 was the best move here, by the way, which I kind of had a feeling of chasing the knight first and probably then taking it, yeah, then you can recapture. And so just taking advantage of those tempos when you have them, just to get the huge pawn center would have been a smart thing to do. And yeah, Stockfish agrees with me here that just taking that bishop was the best move. Okay, Queen e2 was a close second and castling also was good. But having the opportunity to get rid of the bishop pair, and now I have both bishops against both knights on an open board, Stockfish says, yeah, that's very good. This is a nice nice position for, for me, okay? So that's what I wanted to check, but that was, was accurate there. So the end of Gambit, very, very risky. Basically, the key takeaway here is that if you're playing this as black, you don't want to take this, okay? Now, a lot of beginners, I think, will take that, and they're, they're going to get into trouble after e5, but uh, d5 is what they're supposed to play, just kind of counterattacking at the center. There's a principle in chess... Let me flip the board here. There's a principle in chess. When somebody plays f4, you should consider the move d5. It applies in a lot of situations, actually. Even, for example, the uh, King's Gambit. One of the best responses is the Falkbeer Counter Gambit, where you play d5, right? Uh, if you see f4, think about d5. It happens in the Vienna Gambit. It happens in some other openings as well, but very, very common uh, idea. All right, guys. Don't forget, in one week, breaking 1500 is going to be opening up for enrollment. I'm super excited. You're going to have so much fun in there. You're going to learn a ton. It's going to be a community. It's only open for five days, like I said, so I can really focus on everybody who joins. So make sure, mark your calendar. Waitlist is down below if you want to sign up. I know I've been mentioning it a lot lately, but I really don't want you guys to miss out on this. I, I really do think it's going to help you get past 1500 as quickly as possible. So um, that's it. Thank you, guys. I'll see you next time. And as always, stay sharp, play smart, and take care.